Hello and welcome to the SETI Live. My name is Bettina Fogé. I'm the director of the SETI Institute's Artisan Residence Program. Today we are meeting Daniela de Paulus, the newest member of the SETI Institute's Artisan Residence Program. Daniela is a media artist who's also a licensed radio operator and a license, uh, licensed radio telescope operator. We will discuss how she fuses radio technologies and art, discuss her recent work Cogito in Space, and we get a sneak peek of the project she has planned to complete during her residency. But before I introduce our guest, I would like to take a moment to welcome our viewers who are joining us from around the world on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. Hello, everyone. Please let us know where you're from in the comments. And if you have questions from Dan for Daniela, please put those in the comments too, and we will get to them at the end of our chat. So let me introduce Daniela. Daniela de Paulus is a former contemporary dancer and media artist. She has been implementing radio technologies and philosophies in her art project since 2009. Daniela is the recipient of the Baruch Bloomberg Fellowship in Astrobiology at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. She is also collaborating with prominent research institutes such as the Italian Research Institute for Radio Astronomy, the Donders Center for Neuroimaging, and the University of Cambridge. For her projects, she uses state-of-the-art radio telescopes such as the Square Kil Kilometer Array in the UK, as well as historical antennas, such as the Bochum Radio Observatory in Germany and the Dringelou Radio Te Telescope in the Netherlands. Daniela has collaborated with the Human Space Program, the Space and Society Working Group, and the Lifeboat, Lifeboat Foundation. She's a member of the IAA SETI Permanent Committee and a member of the METI Committee. And just this month, Daniela has joined the SETI Institute's Artist in Residence program as an affiliate. Welcome, Daniela. Hi, Bettina, hey, everyone, and thank you for the warm welcome and introduction. It's really an honor to be part of the SETI Institute's family, Artist in Residence, and I'm really looking forward to working together and uh, collaborating with you and the scientists at the Institute. Well, it's fantastic to have you with us. Uh, you really occupy this wonderful art, science, and technology intersection because, like I said in the intro, you are an artist, a media artist, a former dancer, but you're also a radio operator and a radio telescope operator. That's an unusual mix. Tell me more about how you uh, got to that area of interest. Yes, it is It is really a very peculiar trajectory in my life. I, my background, as you mentioned, is in, uh, in actually fine arts and, uh, and choreography and uh, contemporary dance. Um, and uh, performance has been really influential in uh, the type of work I am making now and that I've been making for the past uh, 20 years, actually. And... Although the connection between dance and radio waves, radio transmissions is not so obvious at first, um, I feel that it's really, for me, it was a really natural progression because um, in dance, you, you train to really be aware of space around you and inside you. So there is this ongoing um, research and understanding on the on the uh, inner space of the body and the outer space. And outer space can be the space of the stage, the space that, uh, you know, encompasses uh, everything that is around you and between you and the other performers. So I really developed this understanding of space, which is extremely flexible and uh, potentially uh, endless. And that really led me eventually to uh, work with space in uh, greater scales, eventually ending up in outer space. And uh, and I work with it in a very philosophical, conceptual manner. Um, so I, I think radio waves fits perfectly because um, it is a media which is really conceptual. It's not... Uh, uh, visible, but it is very much a physical connection between human and 
what is in the cosmos. So I found that from the very start really fascinating that uh, through radio waves we can uh, remotely touch another object like the moon or you know we can, we can travel at the speed of light and uh, communicate with faraway planets and uh, somehow trying to understand the cosmos and uh, I find that extremely compelling, fascinating. I, I think you make a very interesting point because uh, when we think about art, normally we think about visual art or music or performance, but radio waves, it's something that we can't really see unless maybe we were, had different kind of ears or sensory input for humans. So uh, I love that you have to take that conceptual angle. How did you, um, how did you become a radio astronomer? You have a license. What does one do to get that? Yes, a radio, a licensed, uh, I'm a licensed radio operator. It, it was a really a quite, quite an organic uh, progress from collaborating with the radio operators, um, especially at the beginning of my work with radio technologies in 2009. My very first project with radio technologies involved the collaboration with radio operators. So I learned a lot by just... Uh, looking at how they work. I also borrowed some of their methodologies in my work in some of my earlier performances, uh, where, for example, we moon bounce images in real time. And um, so I started working with these global networks of people, including radio operators, the audience, uh, streaming the performances on the web. So uh, I really, uh, it was really a natural progression, progression for me uh, from uh, learning by doing to eventually register to get a radio license. And uh, of course, it's very technical and it's not the kind of language that comes to me naturally. But um, eventually it was really worthwhile for me to understand much better the material that I use for my projects, which is this radio transmission. So um, although I'm not a very active radio amateur, I... And please, I somehow learn the language in a greater details. Yeah, I think it, so many times when we uh, transverse different kind of knowledge silos like art and you know this kind of science or that kind of science, it's it's the kind of languages that we need to learn different kind of vocabularies, and that is really fascinating. That it's like you're learning a, a foreign language, the language of radio telescopy. And Absolutely. And it was at first for me really, um, especially um, 15 years ago, um, in 2009, 13 years ago, um, art and science were not yet as uh, a great match as now. It was, um, it was really a very experimental field, although it's been uh, developing for many years. Uh, still, I think especially the art field, uh, art field was not uh, at ease with the use of scientific language. And for example, when I was giving an artist talk, um, it would feel really a bit, um, really like an, an extraterrestrial language almost really amongst the artists uh, to cross over with a much more technical uh, or if you like objective language like uh, science or technology. Yeah, uh, I just want to take a moment to say hello from people who are really joining us from everywhere around the world. Hello to Transylvania, to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, uh, Lake Charles in Louisiana, uh, Homestead in Florida, Colorado, St. Louis, East Palo Alto, and let's see if we have anybody. Oh yes, I remembered that and seeing that in the chat. Uh, Laurie from Glasgow in Scotland, and. Um, Let's see if I, oh, and hello to Mexico. Uh, it's really a, a, a global audience. I'm always stunned. It's just such a delight. Um, I think it may be a, a really cool idea to maybe see some images. Uh, I know you've been working on a fantastic project called Cogito in space. It's Cogito, right? Yes, it's yes. Latin. Tell me a little bit more about that. That's an ongoing project. Yes, actually, Cogito in Space was uh, a very long, one of my longest projects that I started as early as 2013. And uh, while I talk, I'll try and share some 
images as well. Um, and uh, yes, this this project um, is really um, for me was uh, really interesting because it's where I started. Um, taking the collaboration into a much more interdisciplinary um, field. So um, with culture and space, basically, we transmit uh, into space the brainwaves of people who um, watch a film in virtual reality. And the film shows images of the Earth seen from space. So it was a collaboration with uh, Frank White from the Overview Institute. And um, uh, the, uh, the the project was set at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope in the Netherlands. So it was um, actually, it was a site-specific project. I'm trying to find <laughs> this slide. Um, and so the, the research took long time because uh, in 2013 um, virtual reality was not uh, yet completely user um, friendly as it is now so what we were trying to do was combining lab grade electroencephalogram device um, with uh, virtual reality and that uh, required two years of uh, development and that eventually led to the full implementation of the project in 2018 after several experiments and uh, performances that were more like a uh, work in progress. Eventually, we managed to combine this uh, lab grade device, which um, has 32 electrodes and covers the entire skull with uh, virtual reality. And we could convert the brain activity recorded while the participant watches this uh, film of the Earth seen from space, we could send that into space in real time. So that was also a, an additional step to the complexity of the, of the project. But the feedback I got from the participants was really encouraging because um, I, I noticed that they really somehow um, understood, I mean, they, they, they really participated in the experience in the way I wish they would, which is uh, giving people the possibility of um, kind of establishing a, a more um, kind of intimate uh, connection with the cosmos, so a more personal journey and uh, trying to really um, imagine that they travel into space with their mind and um, and really thinking of themselves as somehow uh, part of a much bigger matter. So um, it's very open to interpretation. And this is also part of part of the work. Every person who participated um, really, uh, I think, uh, joined in a, in, a, in a different way. So it's um, something which leaves uh, a very subjective um, understanding, I guess. I, I absolutely love this idea because so few of us humans have been able to go to space. And uh, you mentioned the overview effect. I mean, this is something that astronauts talk about seeing the earth in its, in its entirety from space. Uh, and that it somehow changes the understanding of where we are and our planet and, and our place in it. So by creating this VR experience, you are giving people the opportunity maybe to have a little taste of that. Yes, absolutely. It was really uh, at the beginning, uh, I was um, questioning what I should really show in this film. So it's an eight minutes film. And um, at first I was planning to show footage of the Earth in some space from the International Space Station, but eventually that plan developed into the making of a film, which is more like an artistic interpretation of the overview effect. Uh, so it is really, um, again, a very, uh, very poetic, very subjective journey that takes the participants from the um, start of the, of, the, of the cosmos, from the Big Bang to the um, birth of uh, stars, of galaxies. And eventually at the end, towards the end, you see the curvature of the earth and somehow it was for me a, a way also to 
remind ourselves that we only know the earth from images it's our mm -hmm. you know our own planet and we don't really know our planet we never saw the face of our planet we only know the uh, the planet as far as our horizon goes and uh, it is quite interesting that we live on a planet that we never actually saw and uh, the only images we know like the blue marble or you know these these iconic images that are pretty much printed in everybody's unconscious by now uh, are a very you know very interesting memory that we have of our of our of our home really yeah i think that's a fascinating point i think maybe that's why so many some people think the earth is flat because that's that's a perspective right you really have to go up to see the curvature and I, you're right so many people take the blue marble for granted as though we've seen it ourselves and i think that is the power of science being able to send probes up but also the power of artists to give us images and help us think in different ways so yeah, I know you have another project that you mentioned to me earlier, Mare Tranquillitatis, is that right? Uh, it's called Mare Incognito, Incognito. and uh, it is the follow-up of Cogito in Space. So it's mm -hmm. taking uh, a journey even more extreme <laughs> into the cosmos through the unconscious. And essentially it's a film that we made at the Muller, the radio observatory in Cambridge in uh, March, 2022. And uh, we filmed uh, this time myself, I was the performer of the film and I transmitted into space the brain activity of sleep and deep sleep. So we were interested, the, the neuroscientists uh, and the radio astronomers and myself, we were interested in the moment of falling asleep um, and the, the, the deep sleep stage, which is when we experience what, what is called minimal self. So the consciousness seems to be fading away. Neuroscientists uh, don't know exactly whether there is some part of consciousness during deep sleep or if we are pretty much like uh, at, the, at the edge of uh, life. Um, so I was re interested in creating this poetic resonance between this uh, form of emptiness in, uh, in our inner space and uh, the emptiness of outer space and how these two forms of emptiness can actually create a very interesting dialogue. And um, also working on the project, I, I understood that this idea of uh, associating sleep with death, the cosmos, it's a very ancient one and it's been really uh, developing across centuries throughout um, most cultures uh, around the world. And uh, together with an intellectual historian, I'm trying to map this um, web of the history of sleep. Um, and uh, it's quite, uh, quite engaging. Wow. Um, looking forward to seeing more of that. Wonderful follow-up. And, and this intersection of uh, radio telescopy and neuroscience is really fascinating too. I, I think it just happened uh, really very naturally that uh, somehow they, both uh, fields of science are asking so many fundamental questions about human existence and in general about life. Uh, just like the SETI Institute. I mean, we are very interested in these fundamental questions on, uh, uh, you know, just consciousness and uh, what is the cosmos, what, what is ex the existence. Um, and uh, it felt really quite, uh, for me, it really happened very uh, organically that I would bring together these two platforms. Well. Do you want us to give us a sneak peek of what you're up to at the residency? I don't know how much I should reveal. I'll leave that to you. I can reveal uh, some parts for sure, because we already published, uh, presented publicly the first uh, stage of the project. Uh, the project is called A Sign in Space, and the title is borrowed from uh, a, a novelist called Italo Calvino, who has been uh, very influential in uh, my in, in a lot of my projects, is a, is a wonderful science fiction writer, and um, 
so a signing space is I, I first of all find the title already quite uh, uh, poetic because uh, it suggests that in this huge expanse of the cosmos there might be a sign and in the novel uh, it's interesting that the character that is uh, looking for this sign in space which actually is a sign that he drew himself many a million of years before and then he goes out again to find it and he cannot find it because of course space is absolutely infinite and uh, so there is this uh, somehow uh, surreal almost uh, humorous um, relationship between the human and the cosmos and our really um, uh, like really necessity to understand whether we are alone or whether it there is a sign out there of, of an intelligence or any civil or any or any type of life actually so uh, what we presented at the beginning uh, of this project in uh, july 2021 was um uh the reception of um, a simulated alien signal so we collaborated with uh, a company called uh, the orbit they launched a satellite containing also our signal and they transmitted the signal uh, towards Earth and um, two radio telescopes uh, from ENAF, the Italian Institute of Radio Astronomy, received the signals and uh, uh, they have been, I understand, they've been trying to decode it. So the signal is actually the Arecibo message. So uh, I decided to transmit the Arecibo message because I, of course, it is quite, uh, um, quite an interesting question whether we will be able to understand even ourselves. So uh, will, will human be able to decode the Arecibo message if it was transmitted towards Earth? So that was my thought experiment. And this is the project that I will keep developing at the SETI Institute and will uh, we'll, uh, eventually acquire a, a much bigger scale. Well, so for those who don't know, what is the Arecibo message? The Arecibo message is, I believe, the first um, interstellar message that was uh, sent intentionally towards a potential extraterrestrial intelligence and was composed by Frank Drake. And uh, the exact date of transmission, I am I'm sorry, I completely <laughs> forgot it was no, put it in the comments <laughs> i'm sh i should know but it's i it's in the 70s but i don't remember in 1972 or uh, anyway i'm getting confused also with the voyager records in terms uh -huh. of dates. uh but so this was uh, transmitted towards a very far um uh, star system and uh, it contained mm -hmm. Uh, some uh, information about the biology of humans, the uh, position of our planet in relation to um, the, the solar system and, and pulsars and uh, also other information about the human species from a technological and the scientific perspective. Okay. Uh, and so now you've sent the message back to us on Earth. Uh, was anybody able to decipher it yet? You said they're still working on it. Yes, they received it. Uh, and I should uh, speak with them actually next week to see if they managed to develop a methodology for uh, uh, the actual interpretation of the message. Because as I understood, uh, safety scientists are mostly uh, interested in receiving a signal that is uh, unmistakably from an artificial source. Uh, however, uh, there has been not so many attempts in trying to actually interpret a message simply because there hasn't been um, a reception of, of an extraterrestrial message yet. So, uh, so it is a very interesting also um, uh, area of research because um, it's really, I think, very experimental. There is no, no material really to work with. Yeah, I, I think it's brilliant that an artist is, you know, helping scientists kick the tires of that whole receive a message, decode a message uh, project. 
before we get to questions from the audience, uh, I would just like to take this opportunity to remind our viewers that the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization and it is due to generous contributions from viewers just like you that uh, outreach events like this very SETI Live are possible. If you would like to support us, please consider go, going to seti.org forward slash give now. Maybe you could be a SETI star. And uh, every little bit helps. So thank you very much. Okay, so let's, uh, for questions, I actually have a questions about the METI aspect, the sending a message into space aspect. You think it's safe? Are there, uh, should we be, should we be concerned sending some something out to somebody who may not be as polite as we are and come over and just raid our planet? What are your thoughts about that? Yes, thanks for the question, Bettina. I think this is a really great and very important question. So uh, I, I'm also uh, um, uh, an advisor uh, in the METI, although I haven't been very active. Um, I think that uh, it is definitely a concern. Um, I understand why part of the scientific community is concerned about this topic. I think we are uh, compared to the 70s when we were, um, I think, just starting uh, considering really systematically the possibility of an extraterrestrial intelligence and uh, communicating with them. Now, SETI has become really mainstream science. It's really widely uh, debated and uh, established. And um, so I think there are now a lot more questions than it used to be uh, 60 years ago, for example. So I think uh, it is one of the many questions. Uh, is it safe? It's no one, of course, we don't know. We simply don't know. And um, in my projects, uh, I avoid targeting a specific celestial objects. So when I transmit uh, into space, for example, my brain activity, I keep the antenna still. So what happens is that the stream of radio waves is spread across uh, space, uh, partly because I want to remove this possible backlash of um, uh, targeting a potential extraterrestrial intelligence, but also because in my projects, transmitting into space is not about creating a communication with the extraterrestrial intelligence, but rather really to create this deeper connection between uh, humans and, and the cosmos. And as I mentioned earlier, for me, radio transmissions are more a sort of strings that we, we create um, conceptually and also physically with, with outer space. Yeah, in the end, we, we are sending messages to aliens, but really we're talking to ourselves. The search for Absolutely. aliens is the search for us, right? To us understand ourselves better. Absolutely. A lovely poetic angle. Uh, I'm also, uh, oh, by the way, I would like to mention, in case, thank you for the people who are putting uh, in information in the chat. Um, the Arecibo message was sent out in 1974, and uh, apparently uh, the message was already uh, deciphered, says Paul Felicia. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I, I have another uh, a question regarding uh, when, when, like, like, let's say, so you're sending the next part of your project that you're doing with us. You're sending out a message, it gets received. What happens next? Um, do do people suddenly actually think they've been contacted contacted by aliens, or are you saying, P.S. This is Daniela de Palace. It is an art project. Do not panic. Yes, that is definitely uh, an aspect of the project that um, uh, it is going to be debated with everyone at the SETI Institute because there is a lot of research in this field called post detection. And uh, it is, of course, important to know how far research in this field. Um, is gone in terms of understanding the possible reaction of different cultures, different people towards the possibility of discovering 
a, an extraterrestrial signal. But in this case, indeed, it is an artwork. So it, it will be clear that it is a, a live performance art event. And the objective of this, of this performance is really, as you mentioned earlier, Bettina, to reflect upon ourselves as humans and really um, ideally to uh, provide some food for thought for how we are living uh, now as, as humans. I, I can't wait to receive your sign from space. I'm so delighted to have you part of our SETI Institute Air Program family. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you to all our viewers from around the world for joining us today for this SETI Live. And uh, stay tuned. Oh, before I go, I would like to mention that the SETI Institute on the 14th, we will have a scientist talk about the JWST images that were released on the 12th. So make sure that you uh, check back with us for our next exciting SETI Live. Until then, thanks very much and take care. Bye. Bye.